I think we are all the charm of people now. joining makes me feel like I'm back in Hodges. So yeah, I um I had forgotten I turned that on. Uh, <laughs> I've been doing virtual office hours and I need to know gotcha. who's in. And now I'm like, oh, I better turn that off before I have a fun day. So okay, look again at all of these amazing and wonderful people who are here today to learn about. Archives 101, why do we do it that way? With our university archivist, Erin Laramore, and I am going to turn it over to Erin. And I am going to start sharing slides. Boo. All righty. Let's see if I can get this to cooperate properly. Can you all see that? Thumbs up. Erica, I can literally, okay, good. You're the only person whose video I can see just on the screen right now. So thank you. Um, so Archives 101, why do we do it that way? Um, there's a lot that I'm going to go through in this because I could talk, I mean, I teach a semester long archives course for San Jose State's library school um, online, of course in normal times, but um, I'm going to try and give you the quick overview that I often give the students in week one of, of that class um, it, that skips beyond the just kind of what are archives to kind of a broad overview of, of some of the theories and some of the practices that particularly for folks who are used to working in libraries seem weird. But before I dive in too deeply, I'm going to start with a tiny bit of American archives history, just to set you up for everything else. So from the beginning, American archival practice developed along two different approaches to the management of records. There was public archives tradition and the historical manuscripts tradition. That's for, for those who don't know, that's the National Archives building in DC. The public archives tradition focuses on the records of government authorities at all levels of government and really emphasize the importance of archives as a source of accountability. The records provided guarantees for citizens ensuring legal rights and preventing infringement of those rights, um, either by fellow citizens or by the government itself. At least that's the, you know, happy hope. Um, in fact, actually in the Declaration of Independence, the founding fathers charge that King George III had maliciously called together legislative bodies at places that were unusual, uncomfortable, and, dis and distant from their depository for public records. So they complained that they were having to meet away from their public record uh, holdings. Um, they actually felt that without access to their records that they wouldn't be able to really defend their rights. And so this tradition historically developed along lines that combined public policy, political science, with a little bit of history, but there was a really heavy focus on administration of the materials of the institution itself. So, you know, if you work at the National Archives, you're worried about the records of the federal government. University Archives, I worry about the records of the university. Um, you may also hear these called institutional archives now because they're focused on documenting their own institution. The second approach to record keeping in America is the historical manuscripts tradition, um, motivated largely by the sense that they had just made history. Members of the American Revolutionary Generation right after the war ended, in their later years, they were really focused on establishing historical societies. And then when they started passing away, their kids were focused on really founding these historical societies that would, quote, preserve the manuscripts of the present day to the remotest ages of posterity. Um, the picture you see there is actually the Massachusetts Historical Society, which was the first one officially founded in 1791. Um, hundreds more historical societies popped up across the United States. Every time someone said, oh, we're losing the older generation, um, this is when they popped up. Uh, I wrote an article a long time ago about the establishment of the East Tennessee Historical Society, and it was founded, for those who don't know, Tennessee had the state of Franklin, which was an independent, trying to be an independent state um, of part of East Tennessee and lots of western and bits of northwestern North Carolina. And when those folks started passing away, their kids really wanted to establish this historical, historical society for memory. Um, 
So this historic manuscripts tradition is rooted heavily in the practice of history and but largely on the use of the records to tell a historical narrative um, and the historical narrative that the founders of the institution wanted to tell. Uh, today, you, you might hear these called collecting archives, our manuscripts collection here at UNCG, including things like the cello music collection and the women vets collection would fall under this umbrella. So before I move on, I do want to mention someone who is very important to me and to the world of archives in general who passed away last month. Um, Dr. David B. Gracie was the Governor Bill Daniel Professor in Archival Enterprise at the University of Texas. He actually created the archives program there, which during its heyday was pretty much recognized as the best archives program in the country. He also taught archives workshops across the United States and around the globe. A friend of mine who teaches at Michigan actually told me a couple of weeks ago that um, he's from the Philippines originally, and Ricky told me that Dr. Gracie came to the Philippines 25 years ago and taught archives workshops and that to this day the official uh, archives of the Philippines still uses his stuff to train new hires. So when I was thinking about going to grad school, he's the first person I talked to when I was in grad school. I was his TA um, and I also was lucky enough to get a scholarship that um, he had endowed in his mother's name. So I literally could not have afforded grad school and would not be an archivist today if it wasn't for Dr. Gracie. So I've created my entire talk today around the 10 fundamentals of archival enterprise, something that honestly, I pretty much just stole from Dr. Gracie and still, like I said before, using my own teaching today. He would use this uh, list of fundamentals as part of his general introduction to archival work in the Intro to Archives course. So I just thought I'd uh, share his awesomeness with all of y'all. So fundamental number one, archives are us. Archival collections consist of the records that were written, received, and gathered by an individual or organization during their everyday life or work. These were record groups that were produced organically and not necessarily and not usually with a mind towards um, creating the records for long term preservation in an archives. But after these records of day to day life are no longer needed, the archivist may choose to add the material to the archives because we really um, there's a feeling that those materials say something about us, something that we collectively want to remember uh, for good or for bad and something that we want to continue to have um, the ability to use. Now, saying that archives are us doesn't necessarily mean that archives always represent all of us and all of us equally. Archives aren't neutral. They carry the biases of the collections creator, the archivist, the archival institution, and just society at large. Through selection, description, reference, exhibits, and things like that, there are certain stories that are privileged and other ones that get marginalized. And then archival silences will develop when these past events and perspectives are erased from the historical record. And they could be erased either through the actions of the person who originally was, you know, who the records originally belonged to as part of their day-to-day -day life or work. They could be erased by choices that the archivist or the archival institution made, or they could have been erased by the choice of the people who are being documented, who either chose not to, or just don't live in a society where documents in the way that we think of it in the West exist. So, I mean, archival work is a societal product and archivists have to examine what's being collected, what isn't being collected and why that is. So fundamental number two, archivists think in groups. Fonds, F-O-N-D-S, um, French, I have a, I can't fake a French accent. I can't do anything other than a South Carolina accent. But fonds or bodies of records are the basic units with which archivists work. The record creator, that person or organization who built the collection over the course of their day-to-day -day life or work, the the collection creator is the driving force behind these groupings, not subject matter, not geographic location or any other reason. One of the guiding principles of archival enterprise is known as respect de fond, 
again, fancy French, um, literally respect the group. The principle maintains that records should be kept according to their origin and in the units in which they were originally accumulated. So we would keep the records of person A separate in a separate collection from the records that of person B or person C. Now, respect fond is very important to archives because it points to the idea that guides most of our theory and practice. The idea that context is critical to archival research and use. The organizational, functional, and operational circumstances surrounding the materials creation, receipt, storage, and use, that's all vital if you're gonna be able to truly understand what it is that you're seeing. Number three. Archivists are never out of order. Uh, another guiding principle of archival enterprise is the principle of original order. Essentially, whenever possible, that's the key, whenever possible, archivists seek to maintain the original organizational framework that was used by that collection's creator. Again, knowing how the creator organized their records provides valuable contextual information about the creator and the records themselves. That said, we don't always receive records directly from the collection creator, and we're not always able to discern the original order. For example, uh, I actually remember, and I won't name which department it is, but there was one department on campus who sent us two giant boxes filled with loose paper. Um, they had dumped everything into the box out of the folders because they wanted to reuse the folders. So when you get something like that, first of all, you cry a little bit inside, but then you also um, have to figure out what the heck to do with it. Um, when this work, when this happens, you know, we have to gain that intellectual and physical control over essentially chaos. To do this, we typically create small groups of materials within the collection known as series. So we create these series within the larger collection. Series are usually reflective of a grouping that's either based on format, so something like a series that's photographs or diaries or maps, or sometimes series are created based on function. So we'll see maybe business papers, genealogical papers, legal papers. Number four, one good record deserves another. All of this work to gain intellectual control over a collection is reflected in a finding aid. This is the record that we produce to tell others about our archival collection. A finding aid typically contains information about the collection's management, the collection creator, and the collection's organization and arrangement. Remember that archivists work on the phones level, so our finding aid doesn't seek to describe every single item in our entire collection. Instead, we use the finding aid to place archival resources in context. Basically, we're setting the stage for a researcher. So typically, when I'm teaching my archives class for the master's program at San Jose, um, this is when students who are well-versed in library practice start giving me confused looks or getting upset over the fact that we don't do item level description. But I always go back to the notion of fonds being the basic level of control in archives. When you catalog a book, you don't catalog individual pages or even individual chapters. You catalog the book as a whole because that book is the basic level of control. In archival enterprise, the fonds or collection, um, that's that basic level. So the records we create to describe what we have are also created on that basic level. So one thing about finding aids that's a little bit different from catalog records as well is that finding aids will also include information about hierarchical arrangement. And this is why archivists developed encoded archival description, which is a standard for encoding, specifically for encoding finding aids. Um, again, we identify subgroups within the fond known, and we call those series. And within that, you can even have subseries. Um, you can, you know, there, there's a level of arrangement, a level of hierarchy that looks sort of like a, you know, an outline. Um, we need to be able to show these in our finding aids. We need to be able to show our series and series and how they nest with e within each other. And so that's what um, 
our finding aids, but also encoded article description allows us to do. So number five, every user is a case. As I've mentioned, our principles of respect of fond and original order are in place to help preserve information about the context in which the records were created and used and managed by that original collection creator. We do this as opposed to something like picking and choosing across the collection to have you know, a World War II collection that just includes everything we have about World War II. We do this because every single user comes to the archives with a different question and a different goal. We have researchers who are historians, genealogists, administrators, artists, the list goes on and on and on. But all and then even this single document can touch on multiple subjects. Any of you who have ever read a letter that someone wrote to their family in 190 whatever, um, it's not about one topic. And so any of those subjects might make a collection useful for one researcher or not useful for another. So by sticking, it, sticking to that um, collection creator and respecting kind of the provenance where everything originate, originated, we're not privileging one researcher over another. We're creating a system that um, balances things out. And yes, you may have to learn how to navigate it, but everyone's gonna to have to learn how to navigate it in the same way. So number six, records don't save themselves. One other thing that my San Jose students um, sometimes struggle with is the notion that archivists don't save everything. And especially the fact that we don't want to save everything. I always laugh and say, um, I, I, some of my friends uh, and I, often laugh and say we as archivists actually enjoy not saving things. We really enjoy throwing things away. Um, I think I saw Patrick was on here earlier. The departmental term, term for getting rid of stuff that's not supposed to be in the archives has become to Patrick it. But it works for me too. I enjoy, I enjoy trashing uh, things that shouldn't be saved. Um, so in an archival context, appraisal is the process of determining whether the records and other materials have permanent archival value. It has nothing to do with financial value. So we're not talking uh, antiques roadshow appraisal here. Um, the basis of archival appraisal decisions can include a number of different factors, including where the records came from, what the records have, um, their authenticity, authenticity and reliability maybe, um, their order and completeness, the condition, cost to preserve them, um, your ability to preserve them. If you have the ability to manage born digital records, you probably shouldn't be acquiring born digital records. Um, and then the informational value that they contain. Does it, does, do the records have informational value that has a value beyond what they put in place for, um, for the original creator? So there are many different theories and practices that guide archival appraisal, both on the phones level, but also when we're thinking about materials within a creator's collection. Um, in many archives that follow the public archives tradition, these are uh, institutional archives that serve to document the history itself, a record schedule guides what comes to the archives. The record schedules a list of record series commonly found in many divisions within an organization, indicating their respective retention periods and um, other instructions for what's supposed to happen to the records after they've kind of fulfilled their life in the office itself. This is what we do in university archives. There is a very, 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 very lengthy um, record schedule that's published by the UNC system and above that the state archives that guides which groups of records are supposed to come to the archives. Um, in most institutions, the overwhelming majority of records, and I'm talking like 98% of the records are disposed of when they reach the end of their life cycle. Only a teeny tiny fraction come to the archives. Now, on the collection level in historic manuscripts tradition is usually guided by collection development policy or some sort of mission statement. But within that framework, there are 
an infinite number and y'all would be really bored if I talked about it for a long time, but I love talking archival appraisal theory. There are many, many different appraisal theories that drive approaches to archival collecting and determining which records within a collection will eventually come to the archives. And use of the theories is situational. You can take a little bit of one and a little bit of another to combine them together. You might have one theory that you're applying to one collection and another theory you're applying to another. So instead of making you listen to an entire lengthy speech on archival appraisal theories, I'll just give you an example of one. Documentation strategy is one of those many appraisal theories that we use here at UNCG. Documentation strategies are typically undertaken by collaborating with record creators, archives, and users. So it's, it's a collaborative process, documenting a project activity or something else that's ongoing. So it's archival documentation while something is still happening. A key element for this is analysis of the subject that's being documented, how that subject is documented in any existing records, both in your institution and kind of in the record creation universe, and information about what's lacking. And then of course you develop a plan to capture adequate documentation of that project. And that plan might actually involve creating records yourself if necessary. This is the, this is the theory that drives the appraisal work in Wellcrafted. Um, we actively work with the North Carolina Brewing Company to learn community to learn more about the records that exist, what records they create during their day-to-day -day work, and then we use oral history to create new records that help fill those gaps. Number seven, archives aren't entombed. Archivists don't do archival work in order to save materials. We do this work because we want collections to be used, used by researchers, students, genealogists, and anybody else who walks through the door who is interested in digging in. Preservation is, of course, important, um, but the work, all the work, up and down, is ultimately for use. Without use and users in the here and now, um, and not some mythical user in, you know, the future. Um, without use and users, there's no point in us doing the work that we're doing. So number eight, and I don't think we have any other Texas people, but I've thrown up a hook on horns for number eight, archivists live on the horns of a dilemma. The use versus preservation dilemma that I just mentioned is one of many conflicts that the archivists balance in their day-to-day -day life. We want people to use our collection, but we want them to use it now. We want them to be able to use it in 20 years, and we want them to be able to use it in 100 years. Because of that, our collections have to be stored and handled in a different way from the general circulating collection. Our materials don't leave the reading room, and they're stored in closed stacks that you just can't browse. The secret is that means that we can put collections on the shelf in whatever order we need them to be in to optimize space. Um, we have a system that tells us where boxes are, and so we can go retrieve a box regardless of where it is, whereas, you know, otherwise you'd have to put it on the shelf in just the exact right way. Also in the reading room, we have processes that work to minimize handling and deterioration of materials when they're being used. Um, for example, we have book cradles that help cushion the spine of bound volumes when you open them. We have our print photos in mylar sleeves so that when you touch them, you're not actually touching the photographic print itself. Some institutions that don't use mylar sleeves have you wear gloves while you're handling photos because that's, that's really the archival document that is most um, damaged by your finger juices. Um, we ask researchers to use pencils and not pens when taking notes because they don't leave permanent marks. A and we know that sometimes these rules seem like a bit much, but there's a solid reason why they're in place. And that reason is to help bridge this gap between now and in the future. Another dilemma that archivists frequently face is the conflict between the right to know and the right to privacy. And honestly, the staffing capability and restraints um, of an archival institution play in here too. 
This is particularly troublesome when we're talking about third parties in the archives. So I define third parties as um, people who didn't really have a say in their materials being donated or deposited into an archival institution. For instance, if I write a letter to Jenny today and Jenny donates her archives, including my letter, to an institution 50 years from now, that archives isn't going to try to track me down and figure out and ask me if it's okay to make my letter that I never thought about it going to an archives. They, they, they don't track me down to ask if it's okay to make that available to researchers. I likely intended the letter to remain private just between me and Jenny, but now it's in an archives and it's available to researchers. And honestly, archivists, no archivist anywhere has the ability or um, the time or resources to track down me or all of the other people like me who would be in a collection like that to ask, is it okay? So number nine, Archival work is archival work. Archivists have a unique history, theories, and practice. Even though archives are often today housed within libraries or museums, archival work is distinct from librarianship or museum work. Even though the archives profession developed out of the history profession here in the US, they are also different fields. And honestly, fields that don't really talk to each other now as much as they used to, sadly. It was really only in the 70s and 80s that we started seeing professional archivists coming out of library science programs and not out of history programs. It was only about 20 years ago, somewhere like that. It was right before, I, I think it was right around when I was in grad school, um, that the National Archives star started allowing MLS trained archivists to apply for archives positions. They had a rule in place where you had to have come out of a history MA program. Um, but still today, and this is always, I mean, we joked about this all the time in grad school about getting our exercise running up and down the stairs in the library at Texas, because if I wanna go to the stacks to do research on some topic about archival work, I'm gonna to have to visit both the CDs, not CD to play music, but the CD section um, of the LC uh, CDs where all the history stuff is. I'm also gonna to have to go to the Zs where the library science stuff is. Archives materials are cataloged in both places. And so, um, you know, you bridge that gap and when they're at, when when things are cataloged in the stacks alphabetically with CDs, usually like two or three floors up and Z's on the top floor, you get your good exercise as a grad student. So to become an artist today, you need a master's in library science or in history. There are many programs that are still history-based programs. Um, but what I always find interesting is that the archivist can't get through a library science program or a history program without le learning the fundamentals of those fields. Um, anybody who's been through uh, an MLS knows that you've usually got four or five or sometimes more um, fundamentals courses that you have to take to learn the broad history and theory of the field. Um, as, as an archivist trained in an MLS program, you learn that for the library science field in general. But it's very likely and very possible that a librarian or a historian could easily get through their MA program, their master's program, without encountering anything more than kind of a brief mention of archival work um, and why it's done. So number 10, records change, but archives are forever. Um, maybe not forever, but at least for as long as possible. The way that people create records is constantly changing with the development of new processes, new workspaces, and new technologies. In the wake of World War II, archivists were faced with managing an exponentially growing sum of government records, thanks to the expansion of government services and the records that ensued. At the same time, typewriters made it a heck of a lot easier than ever to create records, and the mimeograph machine made it even easier to make copies of those records. This is why we see a massive growth in discussions about archival appraisal in the middle of the 20th century. 
we were simply producing more and more records than ever before, easier than ever before and cheaper than ever before. Um, because these new processes demanded them and new technologies just made it a lot simpler. In more recent times, we've been forced to tackle the issues associated with born digital archival records. Um, these are records that are created in a digital format from their start and that lose something if you print them out. If you think about printing an email, there's a header in that email that you don't often see. And if you print it, you're not gonna have that as part of it. And that's valuable information, again, contextual information that you lose when you print. So you wanna, you know, we, we focus on preserving in a native format. Digital records aren't tangible objects like a book or a magazine, but they're, you know, when we think about it, a combination of hardware, software, and computer files. This combination, all three, hardware, software, and computer files, is necessary to be able to make, to access the documents or even just examine them. So say we uncover a cache of uh, three and a half inch floppy disks. We can't just look at them um, and read them like we could if it was a diary that was written in 1798. We first have to find a computer with a three and a half inch uh, floppy drive to just have access to anything that might be stored on the disk, assuming that the disk itself um, hasn't been corrupted in some way. So assuming we can do that, we then have to be able to read the files on the disk. And to be honest, files stored on a three and a half inch floppy disk likely aren't gonna be easy to read with any of the software that we have today. So we have to find that magical combination that brings together hardware, software, and files before we even know what it is, honestly, that we're looking at. So I wanna kind of sum things up, circle back around to Dr. Gracie. I'm gonna see if this will play. Earlier, I will say, uh, I made Richard test it with me and um, the sound worked, but the video was choppy. So let's see if this will play where he can kind of sum up the world of archives for everyone. You know, the best thing about students, teaching students who think they'd like to be archivists is convincing them they want to be archivists, that the people that they're going to work with are the people they want to spend their life working with, and that the material they're working with and what they are doing with it, for whom they are doing it, that is increasing the quality of the foundation of civilization. Civilization which is built on the experience of human beings. Where is that recorded more fully and effectively? than in archives, nowhere. So, you know, I couldn't have summed up anything any better than he did. Um, and I definitely couldn't have done it with more passion or excitement than uh, the man who people call the archival evangelist. So that's your quick 30-ish minute run through uh, archives and the overview of archival work and theory. I will leave it now for any questions that anyone may have. And I'll also leave it up with the really cute dog instead of me on the screen because I really love Mr. Dog and his archives. Yeah, this is a classic archives joke. I love it. All right, thank you so much. Um, I really like the way that you organized that and, and let us see uh, the video of I hope it worked. Angelus. It did. Yeah, I was able Sweet. to. A little choppy, like you said, but I mean, that's what I assume videos are always like on Zoom. Yeah. Um, so does anyone have any questions for Aaron? There haven't been any that came through the chat. Sean did um, elaborate a bit about Patricking, um, but, but no questions that came up that I saw. So does anybody have any questions for Aaron? I will say that this month is uh, part of the reason why I think back in the summer I volunteered to do this in October is because October is American Archives Month. Um, it's not as fun virtually as it is in person, but um, for anybody who is interested, there have been a number of really cool um, 
presentations and, and kind of public discussions about archives and specifically about um, archi archives and archival silences this month. So if anybody's interested, shoot me an email and I'll send you some links to some cool stuff. So Christine has a question. Uh, you mentioned the Philippines early on. The humidity must be terrible there for resources. How tough is it to work with environmental conditions for long-term preservation? That is a great question. <laughs> um, I don't think Scott's here, is he? Uh, Scott's not here, but Sean could also attest to, and Patrick could also attest to um, the fact that it is difficult in uh, the Philippines and it's difficult in Jackson Library to maintain optimal uh, heat and humidity uh, for your collections. Um, you do the best you can. You buy dehumidifiers. Um, many buildings are built Actually, uh, purpose-built archival buildings can be built in a way that optimizes airflow. I don't know specifically if this is the case in the Philippines, but I actually have a friend who um, traveled to some archives in Indonesia. And most of them, you know, multi-story story storage areas. So the storage area is three or four stories high. They actually, instead of having a solid floor, they have graded floors so that the air can circulate throughout the whole space as opposed to being kind of trapped on a floor. Um, ultimately, what matters as much, if not more, than that perfect heat and humidity control, which very few people and places have perfect heat and humidity control, um, is stable heat and humidity control. So records that, um, you know, places like the Philippines have steady, um, steady heat and humidity for the most part, instead of um, things fluctuating greatly. So that in, in archives world, the thing that that is the worst for the materials, physical materials is fluctuation. So if you have a room that is slightly more humid than it needs to be, as long as it stays there and you can keep it at that level, you're doing a lot better than every other day the humidity spikes. Does that make sense? I'm going to stop the share because for some reason I can't have, it was not popping up the chat window for me. All right, do we have any other questions? I actually, now that I just said that, I have one. Um, <laughs> okay. Yesterday, you, you talked about this a little bit, but um, yesterday, maybe the day before, I don't know. Is this Friday? Who can say? Um, I was, I went to an ACERL webinar about zine collecting. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that, <laughs> you're right, Catherine, it is Friday. I just looked. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that someone asked the librarian there who is um, a special collections librarian or archivist, I can't remember what her title was, but she's at the University of Miami. It could be both. And I mean, honestly, the job, this job here of the three jobs, well, four if you count both of them at Tennessee, I've had, this is the first time I haven't had both control over or responsibilities for special collections, so rare books and archives. Wow. Well, she, so, so someone had asked her, um, and it kind of goes back to what you said about like um, letters and, and you know, what uh, your example, like if you wrote me a letter and I later donated all of my papers, um, which I'll, I'll certainly be considering. Um, I, someone asked her, she was talking about zine collections, if she's ever had to basically like been asked to take a zine out of a collection. Um, and she said it's happened a couple of times and it's, it's usually like the, the author of the zine or a contributor to the zine who maybe has changed their political beliefs or mm -hmm. some sort of other reason for wanting to um, get that removed. Is that something that happens in, in archives? Like what happens if in your example, you find out about that letter? Can you contact that archive and say, I don't want that letter? 
I'm the I'm the copyright holder. I don't want that letter. Yeah, I was gonna say that's the key is you are the copyright holder. And most of the cases that you hear, which still are rare, um, coming from something like that have to do with copyright because the materials have been digitized and placed online and oh, not just yeah, made available okay. in the research room. That so, makes sense. You know, making something available in the research room, um, copyright doesn't come into play with with that um you know even the researcher is allowed unless there's some sort of agreement saying otherwise which when i worked at tennessee we had alex haley's papers and alex haley the um who wrote roots uh his estate had set up a special agreement with the university where he basically they basically said you know we're going to deposit the papers there but no one can make copies of anything that we hold copyright of without our consent. Um, that's a super, super, super rare thing. And honestly, most archives would not allow that to happen unless you're Alex Haley. But um, but yeah, so copy copyright usually does not factor into making materials accessible online. So legally, they don't have to do that with the zines. Legally, they could provide access to these zines in their researcher room for research purposes. Ethically, that's when things start popping in. And as with many, many other things, um, ethically is usually a case by case decision or a person by person decision or an institution by institution decision. So the person who was a contributor in that zine who has changed their political opinions doesn't have like a legal grounds for a lawsuit but you'd have to be a really sketchy librarian <laughs> um or archivist to knowingly go against the wishes of the people who created it so you can but most places because they want to build um they want to build partnerships and they want to build community uh, partnerships to grow the collection. Most of them aren't going to, they're going to, they're going to work to, to minimize harm. Um, and, you know, so there is no legal thing that says that would have to be taken out. Now, there is a legal thing that said that if they hold the copyright, again, you can't digitize it and make it available online. And no researcher would be able to use a reproduction in a publication if they didn't want them to. Um, because you do hold, you know, you retain your copyright as the third party creator, but also like Jenny, if you donated your papers to another institution, depending on the institution, you may not sign your copyright over to, to the things you created in the collection either. So. There's a lot of what ifs. I always, I always laugh and any student I'm working with, I'm like, the thing you'll hear an archivist say the most when you start asking about things like that is it depends. Um, and it really does depend in that situation because there's not like a clear cut legal thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. That's, it was just something while you're talking that I was thinking about and it just seems like it would, it would bring up a lot of interesting and potentially frustrating <laughs> questions yeah. sometimes. Yeah, um, and you know, I think most most archives that uh, would create a zine collection um, and go out of their way to create a zine collection are also probably highly attuned to the ethical issues that are involved. Um, you know, we've there's there's been a lot of discussion in the profession recently about ethical issues related to collecting, for instance, materials related to black, the Black Lives Matter movement and protests. Um, there's a group called Document the Now that formed and has issued guidelines about um, ethical collaboration and ethical collection when you're talking about protesters and materials that potentially, if collected, could be, you know, subpoenas or used by cops to track people down. Um, so that ethics of, of, of ethics of thinking about reper, re, the repercussions of your collecting, not just 
give me everything, I want it all, um, which there are still some places that do that, just like there are discussions about the ethics of collecting when you got a lot of money versus the ethics of collecting because you're the right place to steward a collection. Um, I always tell folks, the University of Texas, if you're working on anything related to modern British lit, so anything from 20th century British literature, you have to go to Austin. And British scholars hate it with a fiery hot passion. But um, in the 50s and 60s, Texas had a bunch of oil money and they bought collections because the UK wasn't really, most of the UK um, archives weren't focused on collecting their modern authors. And so Texas stepped up, put some money behind it and became the place, you know, now 60, 70, 80 years later, um, these are things people are wanting to research. And so, you know, there's ethics of collecting around, um, you know, personal privacy, but also the ethics of collecting with money being involved and money that often would go to rich, white, influential men and not to collections created by African Americans or women or LGBTQ folks who would be further marginalized by not being offered anything for their collection in some cases and just being told it's an honor to have your materials here. That is interesting. I had never really thought about that. Um, uh, in yeah, we, I mean, honestly, when I worked at Tennessee, uh, if you want to study East Tennessee history, you can't just do that in Knoxville. Um, even though we had UT and the East Tennessee Historical Society, you've got to go to Chapel Hill because in the 20s uh, and 30s, Chapel Hill had a folklorist who went around to the mountains of East Tennessee and just took stuff from poor people who didn't know any better. Um, oh gosh. And, wow. you know, I have a friend uh, who uh, talks, she's from the Ozarks region. She's an African-American woman who's from the Ozarks. And apparently, I think it's Missouri State or Southwest Missouri, one of the directional schools in Missouri, um, has a huge collection of materials about African-Americans in the Ozarks because they had someone who just went around to the community and took stuff and, you know, said, oh, well, you know, you're not using it. Or even some of the stuff in Chapel Hill was, oh, I promise I'll bring it back. So um, that's, I mean, that's how some of these older historical collections that seem a bit out of place sometimes, that's how they, they develop is because there's either money or colonialism or paternalism at play. So that's, you, a, that's a bummer note. Yeah. Do you get into these conversations with your archive students? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. No, we, we talk a lot about, um, we, we, even actually the honors class that I teach at UNCG that's focused on university history and digital storytelling. We have an entire week where we focus on archival silences and what stories aren't included in the archives and why those stories aren't included in archives, both on kind of the general level, but also on the UNCG level. Mm -hmm. And then um, we dive into looking at oral histories that we have from some marginalized groups. So that's actually, if you count the oral history parts too, that's three weeks of the class right there. Um, in the chat, Christine says, what about genealogists? They love to tell their whole story. That must be challenging at times. Yeah, genealogists are a challenge. Um, they like to tell their whole story and they often um, are taken aback or offended when you don't already know everything about their relative who has their collection, who you have their collection. Um, in, when I worked at UT Knoxville, um, we had a large Civil War collection. So you can imagine Civil War genealogists are even more fun than normal genealogists. Um, and that collection was largely, it largely consisted of small groups of letters, um, often we brought, bought off of eBay um, or from manuscript dealers. Um, small groups of letters or just one individual diary from a soldier who had been stationed, had fought in East Tennessee. Um, and most of these soldiers, not to get too deep into East Tennessee history, but East Tennessee was actually um, a unionist region in a 
Confederate state. Um, and there weren't a lot of actual fights that happened, particularly around Knoxville, but there was an awful lot of people stationed there just staring at people across the river um, for pretty much the entire war. And so we had a lot of soldiers, particularly from Ohio, um, who were who had come down um, to, to work, be stationed in Knoxville. And we would inevitably have researchers who came in and their great, 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 however many greats, grandfather um, was one of the soldiers and we had one of his diaries and they just couldn't understand why we didn't personally know this person's entire history. And it's all we could do to be geek like, yeah, his history is not what our job is. Um, East Tennessee in the Civil War is. <laughs> um, you know, genealogists can be great too, but yeah, sometimes they can be challenging uh, to work with. Um, I'll be honest, more than genealogists, the folks who are even more uh, challenging to work with are some of the more, ex more experienced uh, researchers, perhaps, you know, well tenured faculty members who don't understand all of that why we do what we do piece and instead want the entire organized the entire archives to be organized for their particular research purpose um, and they get really upset that everything isn't organized the exact way that they want it to be organized for their specific research purpose um, to me those are more and much more annoying than um over enthusiastic genealogists I'm sure many of our reference librarians have uh, encountered something similar. Yes, I was going to say this feels very familiar to me as a as a concept. <laughs> All right. Well, I have not seen any other um, questions come in, so I will go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much, Erin. This was great. Thank you all for coming. Um, we do, as I said in the um, email today, we have a session next week about Canvas that I think is gonna be really helpful. And then the week after that, um, we have two different sessions, actually two sessions on election day, one about visual thinking strategies that I haven't advertised yet, and one a session that Rachel and I are leading that is absolutely about anything but the election. Um, so it will be a nice uh, break towards the end of the day that day to think about something else entirely. Um, so thank you all so much for your participation. And again, especially thanks to Erin for presenting. This will be up on the ULVLC LibGuide. And hopefully I have gotten quite behind, but it will happen. Cool. All right, y'all have a great day, great weekend. After you stop the recording, Jenny, I have a question. Okay. Not that it's something horrible and secret that 